Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 135, featuring part two of my interview with Peter Oliphant. In this part of the interview, we talk about how he transitioned from a career as an actor into uh, the world of game development. We talk about his uh, love of the Atari 8-bit platforms and the games he did for uh, uh, Sierra Online. Uh, then we talk about his time at CinemaWare and Interplay, and then a zero in on his game Lexicross. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Peter Oliphant. Yeah, so you mean, it looks like you had a really promising career going with all of the uh, the acting. So how did you end up, uh, you know, in, uh, in programming? The best way to describe that is my love of mathematics. Ever since I was a little kid, in fact, when I was 18 years old, uh, 18 months old, I was able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, which sort of freaked a few people out. So I had a very strong academic past as well, meaning I was getting good grades in school. And so when it came time to go to college, another interesting story where I actually had to make this decision. I had, After my first year of college, I was doing extra work, and I got the bug again to do acting. Because if you don't actually keep up on it, they're not going to come looking for you. So you have to do the effort to it. So... At the end of the summer, I decided, hell, I will look. I I will go into it into an agent and see if I can get some work. Turns out, the agent I went to was the same agent for Ron Howard, otherwise known as you know Opie and Happy Days and all that stuff. He's virtually the same age I am. They said to me at that point that he was going to go to college, and they wanted. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. First of all, back up. They gave me one job to do a movie called Roommates, one of these low budget sexploitation films. The first interview they sent me, I get it. That just impressed them immediately. So then they called me in and gave me the worst, best decision I ever made in my life because it literally started giving me ulcers. They said, if you don't go back to college, we will put you up in line for everything that Ron Howard is now being offered and we guarantee $1 million within five years, which, of course, I don't know if they could do that, but that was what I was told. And a $1 million back then is worth like about five today. And the first thing that they were going to put me up for was some little movie uh, that was going to be a nostalgia film, which I assume was American Graffiti at this point. So in other words, they virtually offered me the starring role in American Graffiti on a play. I would have to have interviewed for it, but putting me up for it, and after three days of thinking about it, much to the chagrin of my parents, I said, I'm more interested in education, so I went back to college. So that's the story. And I don't know if I regret that decision or not today, because they said, well, you could always go back to college. I didn't trust that notion. I don't trust the notion that you don't continue the stream, but that's what I did, and I made the decision. So it was actually a very personal decision not to get out, but to make the decision to go the academic route instead. So. Oh, good for you. I mean, you probably know I'm a college professor, so <laughs> I recommend well, it's trying to suck up a little. Did I get an A? <laughs> well, you still do some extra work. I saw that you had some lovely photos, uh, I believe, for uh, Deadwood. Yep. Uh, some work in that. Look, looking fan <laughs> it's looking like the uh, the archetypal uh, cowboy in that. Exactly. Uh, again, remember I said that Brad Dorff is a very good friend of mine, uh, a name... He was one of the stars of Deadwood, so obviously had a really good in there. In fact, I, I was going through a period where I didn't have any, any employment, and so I called him up and said, it turns out his daughter was a PA on the show. That's a production assistant. So I called him up and I said, can you get me to be a production assistant on the show? And he goes, no, but I can probably get you to be an extra. And, of course, I'd done extra work before, so I said, sure. So I went up for that, and I was on the show for a year, like the second season, the entire second season, the first third of the, or the first fourth or so of the second of the third season, which ended up being the last season, even though it was supposed to be a fourth one. A lot of friends from that. I was known on the set as the person always in front of the camera because whenever they had anything going, I would walk up to them and say, "I can do this." The people there really appreciated that, and so they. If the second season, I'm very visible quite often through the season, so I actually had extras there that would make it a point to stand near me so that they would also be on camera all the time. Uh, when The reason I quit after the first third is I was offered a job in the um, in another, it wasn't in the game industry, but it was programming for a friend of mine of college doing a thing that does things like locates lost dogs and stuff. It was a hardware type stuff. And just one thing bad, if you will, about uh, working as an extra on Deadwood is I was non-union because, and the reason I could have been union, but I went non-union because 
you work 10 times as much that way, even though you get paid half as much. But we literally got paid minimum wage. I got paid like $40 a day to be on that thing. As a programmer, I was going to be earning as much in a day as I would get a week there, assuming I got booked every day. So I couldn't afford not to take that. So, And I, since then, I no longer have that job, but that job lasted three and a half years. So it's been about five years since I've done extra work. But I even today, I mean, I've contacted those guys and would consider to do extra work as a side job because it's a job where you get paid to sit around and wait and have fun watching them fool, uh, film a movie. So it's great. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. I like, you know, I'd like to do something like that. <laughs> it sounds like probably, it's ex extremely competitive could. sounding, though, right? You'd have to have work happening where you're where near where you are, but if they were shooting in Minnesota, they prefer to hire extras from the area that they are than say ship someone out on a plane from LA or something. So it's it's possible. You'd have to have people shooting like some movie or TV I could, show. I could be the, the nerd in the park, maybe, you know. <laughs> well, the hair would probably have they would it's it's funny how they pigeonhole you. Because you have long hair, they would say you would have to be a long haired guy. For example, when I was an extra trying to get a job uh, to be a person that was a passenger on a plane. Parallax View, if you've ever heard of the movie Parallax View, I was one of the extras on the plane there. Uh, at first, they almost didn't accept me because, well, you know, you're a kid. You're supposed to be hired as a kid. And I explained to them, but, you know, there are kids that fly on planes, too. In other words, kids were only hired if they generally called for kids. If, the, if a plane call asked for, we want 30 plane people that are uh, plane passengers, well, unless you said, and kid passengers, they didn't bring on kids, but, you know, it, it was that kind of a thing, but, yeah, that it, uh, it was fun. All right, well, let's get back to uh, back to games here. So I wanted to catch back up with, uh, in 1983, uh, you apparently had moved to, or working with uh, Sierra Online, doing some Atari 8-bit uh, games. Yes. I noticed uh, one called Mr. Cool. Mr. You know, cool. <laughs> sounds cool. It's Kubert. Cubert inspired game, if I'm uh... absolutely. Well, you can you can tell us about this. So, what about sure, Mr. Cool? Sure. First of all, we start off with the fact that I was at Mattel when I moved on to Sierra Online. Now, there's an interesting story about that, in that whereas Mattel was a nice place to work, they had a very corporate attitude. Now, what I I was the this actually has to do with it. It, it trans or it, it like it um, segues to it. I was uh, working at Mattel and I wanted to do, I was the head of the computer game department. So we were allowed to do stuff for Intellivision and like that. Well, I said, and, and Apple and IBM. But I said to them, okay, I have this, uh, I had this like week vacation. On the week, I had this idea for a game. So I programmed the idea. It's called Wall War. At the time, it was called Force Field. And I brought it in after my vacation. So notice I did this on my vacation. I showed them the game and they said, well, you know, this is an Atari game. Atari is our competitor, and we can't support our competitor, so we won't do a game. And I was trying to describe to them what we now know the industry is a razor blade industry, meaning, sure, it's their hardware, but we can make money on their hardware. Well, they wouldn't accept that, so they told me that the game was not acceptable for Mattel. So I continued to do it anyway in my spare time, just for fun. And when I was done, I had a pretty good game, and it turns out Sierra Online was asking for stuff, so I took a day off. And I flew up there and showed them the game. And my mindset was, you know, if they take this game and offer me as much as $5,000, which is a lot of money back then, I would quit Mattel because I could become independent and I would prefer to do stuff of my own games. So I went up there, I showed them the game, and they offered me $16,000. So obviously now it became a no-brainer. So I go back and I tell Mattel I'm leaving. At which point they say, okay, fine. When are you going to give us that game you were working on? And I go, you mean the game you told me that Mattel does not do is not part of what you do for business? I go, yeah. So as nasty as this may sound, I was subpoenaed at my going away party to give up the game, which, of course, I then got a lawyer. He explained to them the situation that that's not the way it worked. It never went to court. But... The point is, is that from there, I took Wall War to Sierra Online, which was then they were allowed to do it because Mattel had no case. But it just shows you a little bit of how there's some strange. They think that they own your mind. In fact, to tell you the truth, when I left there, of course, I had people at Mattel that were still at Mattel. And they told me what meetings I had afterwards. They had meetings about me. And one of the meetings, the lawyer there described that if a janitor worked at Mattel and he wrote a cookbook, that Mattel would own the cookbook because he worked for Mattel. 
And it, again, this is probably part of the reason Mattel Electronics died is because they had these really strange rules. So in any case, really happy experience. I go to uh, Sierra Online. They love the game. Uh, they let me, they said, finish this off. They wanted me to make it more, have a, a better splash screen than most because that's what sells the game. So they liked that, but Wall War didn't sell that much. But then I would became a really big fan of Cubert. I became an expert at Cubert. I could be I was one of those guys who could sit at the thing and I'd go and I'd, you know, build up about twenty-five or thirty lives and go after about an hour and go, you know, I'm done, I'm finished, and I just leave. In other words, I could conceivably play that game forever. In fact, I thought about possibly trying to, you know, attempt the actual world record until I found out to do so, I would have had to have played the game 48 hours straight. I mean, without, you know, and then I was wondering, how do you get breaks? How do you eat food and stuff like that? So I didn't try it. But I found problems with Cuber, meaning it had certain repetitiveness to it and certain things I didn't like. So um, Mr. Cool was a response to that, meaning I did a game which was what I considered Cubert, but better than Cubert. In fact, they liked that. It only took me three weeks from thinking about the game to actually producing and creating and actually having a finished product, which was the Atari version at the time. I also did the Commodore version, and somebody else did the Apple and IBM version. Oddly, they got more money because their royalty stream was better, even though I got a piece of that. But uh, then from there, uh, Sierra Online uh, went through some bad times, but they had some projects they wanted me to do that were their ideas, so I did some of those. There was Dragon's Tale and a Troll's Keep, um, and so I did a few things there, but they actually went through some pretty tough times, and I was independent anyway, so eventually I moved on and did other companies. So the next one being, I believe, Cinemaware. Just, uh, I want to do, uh, you know, Paul's right there for a second, and get you to talk a little bit more about the Atari 8-bit you know, platform. Because most people I have on, they talk about the Commodores and Apples and stuff. I, don't, I haven't really heard much about this. So, just what are your thoughts about the Atari 400, 800s, and you know, how would you? Did you prefer that platform oh. to the Commodore? I mean, how? To oh yes, oh yes, for a number of reasons. One, it was definitely a system made for games. It was one of the first ones made specifically for games. It had hard drives, and back then games didn't really have hard drives, which is good. But the most important thing about the Atari 800 was a completely programmable video screen, meaning you had a thing which was called a display list interrupt. And what that allowed you to do is there's, I forget how many lines that was on the display, but at every single line you could interrupt, at set an interrupt and that interrupt could change the display. So the first half of the display could be one resolution, the next half of the display could be a different resolution. So that control was just, I mean, gorgeous. Plus, you had scrolling capabilities. I mean, you could scroll this part of the screen, but the rest of the screen would stay the same. In fact, I'm not even sure that exists today. A totally programmable uh, video card, which was just wonderful. The bad part about the Atari was the operating system, which crashed if you just breathed on it. Meaning, it was the Atari was known for having this red screen. It had a red screen of death, not a blue screen of death, that came up all the time, which is, I think, it's Achilles' heel because it went out the door sooner. But as I recall, it was made, uh, the Atari was made by a bunch of disgruntled people from other companies that didn't like the way the hardware was there, and they just came out with a brilliant uh, system. But uh, also the fact that you could have cartridges, meaning you could put cartridge-based games, made them very compartmentalized, and that was a really good selling point because it's really nice to be able to go game, different game, and they had two slots, so you could actually have two games going and stuff like that. The 800 was better than the 400, but since the 400 could do anything, the 800, it was nice. The 400 was bad because it had this stupid keyboard that was like pressure keyboard, not really keys, but you touched the various buttons. And that Chiclet was keyboard, I think they call it. Chiclet that. keyboard. Yeah, also, IBM eventually used it as well later on with their, uh, I forget what it was called, PC Junior or something. So, but yes, uh, that's sort of the story about that, so... <laughs> so you moved on to Cinemaware. That's one of my favorite companies. You know, I'm a big Amiga guy back in the day, so I had, I think, just about every one of the Cinemaware uh, games. So how did you end up at uh, Cinemaware, first of all? Well, I was going through, again, there's been many times my industry, and especially being a lone wolf type person, is very sink and swim. So again, I was going through a long period of time where I didn't have any work going on, and I contacted the company because I believe I saw an advertisement for them doing, you know, inter interviewing for some games. So I interviewed with them, 
and they liked me, but they weren't really ready to hire. So I remember calling them back continuously, and it was only three months later that I finally got a hold of Bob Jacob again and said, you know, can I have this job? He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> Come in. So I finally got hired. By the way, I wasn't a programmer in this. I was a producer. I was hired in as a producer. Uh, what happened then is I produced a few games. As, uh, they were already existing games. I was managing people or talking to people that were overseas, like uh, I forget where, but we were using uh, programmers from different countries because just like today, outsourcing, it could be a lot cheaper. Uh, my forte isn't so much uh, being a producer as, as a designer, but there is some design in producing, so I did like that. However, at one point I was producing a game or helping produce the IBM version of King of Chicago. And we needed to have a programmer that could do the little video games that were inside of that. And we needed new ones. So I'm a programmer, so I hired me to do that. In other words, as since I could do that and be the producer at the same time. So I did the little video games, um, and they liked my programming so much, they stopped me being a producer and started me being a programmer and one of the first things I did was Rocket Ranger IBM which was um, an interesting story about that is that they already had the Amiga version of that and they wanted to do conversions and I was supposed to do the IBM they also wanted to do other versions Coleco version too if you remember that machine Coleco version? Yes. Wow for the Rocket Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, I had nothing to do with that, but there were other programmers. That did that. So they had different programmers working on different versions. Now, the person who did the Atari did a scripting system, which means, of course, that the way various things did is he had a language within the program that ran a different script that way. And Bob Jacobs said, and rightfully the so think of how things work at that time, he says, everybody make your program so that it runs this scripting system, so we just have to throw the scripts in. And I said, IBMs were very slow back then, and I said, if we do that, it's not going to work because adding this extra layer is going to slow down the program so much that it won't work. And he was actually kind of mad at me about that because everybody else was doing what he said, but Bob Jacob had the wherewithal to let me, get, to let me do what I wanted to do. About a month later, everyone's showing their demos. Uh, the Coleco is working at like one frame a second. The other ones are working at like one frame a second. Mine's working at 120 frames a second. And so all of a sudden, I'm given an, a brand new, oh, my own office, I'm given all these different perks. All of a sudden I went from a person that you're not doing the right thing to you're my best guy here <laughs> type thing. And uh, I was made in charge of that program, which means I was in charge of the EGA, the VGA, and the CGA version, which were three different versions back then. And he just became impressed with that. So uh, Rocket Ranger, uh, the only thing I have is a problem with Rocket Ranger is they didn't want to redo the box for the IBM. So it says, done by Peter Kaminsky, who did the Amiga version, which it just bothers me that it has the name Peter there because when Pete, you know, why did he have to have the same first name as me? It sounds like I'm now like they forgot me or something, but yes, uh, the IBM on that is it's sort of, oh, the other thing is, is uh, I had extra time. The way I had to do that is that the guy doing the Amiga wasn't done when I started. He was working on it, and what we had to do, there was no document. We had to copy what he was doing, meaning the only thing we had to go by is how far he had gone along in the Amiga version. Well, I got ahead of him, and so I did a, a different game, a new game that wasn't even in the other ones, and threw it in so the Amiga, I mean the IBM version actually has an extra game in it because I was bored and had spare time because I caught up to him and I actually finished the IBM version three weeks after he finished the Amiga version and they gave me a three week project in the middle of it so I consider that to be kind of cool to be able to pay somebody that that's like I said no design document we were basically copying an existing thing that didn't exist yet what's the extra so, game? Uh, it was I remember how it worked. There were these mines, there were these things, uh, I guess sort of like guns that were on the ground, and you had to fly above them and shoot them. And we used this kind of a cool thing. Remember, we don't have 3D back then. I discovered that if you take a black, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, lower portion of the screen and you raise it up and down, it gives you the appearance really visually like you're going up and down on the thing, so you got this feeling like you were actually, when you ducked down, you were flying down, when you ducked up, and then all I had to do is have different copies or different versions of what the guns look like, 
So it really was one of the first 3D looking environments without it actually being 3D. So that's what I did, like a shoot the guns on the ground game, which is not in the Amiga version, but is in the uh, IBM version. I'm not sure if it's in, I think it's also in the EGA and the VGA, in the CGA. I was more responsible, besides being in charge of those other ones, I was responsible for making the VGA version, meaning the other guys did the, they had other programmers to do the other ones, even though they were working under me at the time. So, Sounds like you were having a great time at uh, CinemaWare. Must have. Do you have any uh, favorite game uh, projects that you worked on? Has to be Rocket Ranger, the one Rocket we just Ranger. mentioned, because I worked on it the longest. And, um, and the other games, uh, I enjoyed producing SDI because it was my first... Uh, foray into producing and it was kind of cool that I would do things like go to other people's houses and I I enjoy jobs where my day-to-day -day work is not the same thing every day and producing is that way and programming is more before than it is now because now games last a year or so so you feel like you're doing the same thing like when I did Stonekeep that was five years so I felt really like I was stuck in a rut but back then games took three three weeks six weeks two months to do so your your job kept changing all the time and I enjoyed that but yeah Sinmore was it was a hotbed for a lot of very talented people some of which are out the people that did that also did Seventh Guest that came out of there Rob Landeros who is a, uh, an artist, he worked on that as well. And he and I actually did Lexacross, although I would probably be considered more of the designer on that. But to be honest, Rob Landeros came up with the, uh, shall we say, the seed or the main thought that actually generated that game, which I'm sure we will get into later when we talk about Lexacross. So. Yeah, I like, you know, to actually talk about Lexacross, uh, unless you have any more of those Cinema Wars stories, nope. I'm going to jump no, into this. So yeah, tell us about Lexacross, how this game uh, came about. Okay, that's a fun one, too. Like I said, Rob, which is a person that I had left CinemaWare by this time, was back to being an independent. Um, and so what happened is I used to play tennis with Rob all the time. And he, one time we played tennis, and we went to, I remember we went to a Denny's and just got chock full of coffee, which means we became very yappy and talkative. And he says, I have this really great idea. Why don't we do a uh, takeoff on Wheel of Fortune, but make it X-rated? <laughs> so, so that, well, I wonder what the Vanna White would have been like in that uh. exactly exactly <laughs> but you actually hit on a point because I went home and I was starting to think well you know we may have some problems with that because first of all Wheel of Fortune is kind of a copyrighted game it's owned by uh, I forget the Merv Griffin I believe is the guy that owned it who's a billionaire so you really don't want to sell say ruffle the feathers of a billionaire with such a thing so it occurred to me that we had to have some new rules associated with this game, something that set it apart from Wheel of Fortune. So I came up with the idea that how about incorporating Battleship into this? In other words, what if the board that is typically Wheel of Fortune was first of all covered up with squares and the first part of the game was actually uncovering those squares to reveal it? The other thing is why not incorporate other, uh, other uh, shall we say, uh, game shows like Instead of having it be a phrase, which is what it always is with Wheel of Fortune, what if there were clues up there? Instead of having the phrase, it could be like blue, black, green, and the answer was colors. In other words, this is more like password in a sense, where you do that. Instead of the letters having single values, why not add in Scrabble and throw in the various point values of Scrabble, meaning various letters are worth more, and then you have a wheel that you spin and order, that's like that, that comes up with a number value and that number value, just like in Wheel of Fortune, is times those letters, but then those letters are times, like a Q is worth more than an E is worth more than an N and stuff like that. Uh, so we, uh, I came up with all this stuff, and then I started to think, well, you know, this is so much of a good game on its own, what do we need the X-rated aspect to it anymore for? So that got taken out. Then the game sort of designed itself because we needed a Vanna White character. Now, uh, which, by the way, in our game is called Robana. Uh, the problem is, is that in our game we have to uncover these squares, which is not true in, in Wheel of Fortune. So now we need for her to be tiny. She can't be the size of, of the board, which is what, you know, Rana, Vanna White's just about the size of half the height of the board. She has to be tiny so she doesn't cover up the board. Well, then how does she get to the top? 
And all of a sudden it became clear that we had to put this in the future so that she could become a robot with the capability of flying around. So this is a case where the game is sort of designing itself because I didn't say let's make this a futuristic game. The mechanics of the game sort of decided that it needed to be futuristic to make it work. And so then once we had that, instead of having regular uh, opponents, why don't we have robots and aliens and stuff like that? So we threw all that in. So the game kind of uh, designed itself in that way. Um, let's see, eventually, I then I took it to one company which loved it, and they gave us money to produce it. But then that company went belly up. The interesting part is when a company goes belly up and they fund you to make a game, you don't give them back the money. So in effect, the game got created. The first $10,000 that went into that game got, by, got done free of charge because we got the money and no obligation. Uh, then I went to uh, Interplay. Now, Interplay at that time only has 40 people. And at that time, Brian Fargo was the president. It's not like today where he's not part of Interplay now. He's in, ex in exile. But uh, today, if you wanted to have an interview or get a private meeting with the president of a video game company, I mean, good luck on that, right? Get, try to even get part of their queue. I mean, even try to get a job interview with them today might be tough. But in those days, I called up the company. They said, yeah, we're going to have you talk to Brian Fargo. Now, I brought in the game, showed it to him. It was just a demo of it at the time, although a little bit more work because of the production values from the previous company. And he looked at it and he was sort of lukewarm about it. You know, it was okay. So, but he wasn't bad or good. He says, I'll let you know. So I, it turns out I was in, since where that was is where Rob was, again, I went and played tennis with him that night and got home about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I my, on my phone, there's about five phone messages, and they're all from Brian saying, I want your game. I need your game. Let's talk about your game. Let's talk about it on Monday. So I, I said, so I said, okay, so he's going to call me on Monday. Well, he calls me Sunday morning. He didn't even wait until Monday, and he goes, I took it home. I played it with my wife. My wife absolutely loves this game. And in fact, today, and it's still true, this is one game where I had, I've had girls walk up to me sight unseen, like, I don't play any games, but I love your game. This is the holy grail for a game that women like to play. And I'm still going to try and market it that way because the game didn't do as well as it should then. But in any case, long story short, too late, I know about that. Uh, it turns out that uh, he loved the game. He then gives me money for it. We then He wants internet capability. Not internet, modem play. There is no internet at the time. He wants modem play capability for it. So we throw that in. And uh, it did okay. The only reason we think it didn't do well is the cover has a picture. It was very much a family game. As we said, it appealed to women a lot. For some reason, they decided to throw what is quite literally the picture of a nude robot on the cover. Uh, X-rated factor crept back in. That's kind of kept, interesting. Right. <laughs> and it did not. And the other problem is that we couldn't come up with a good name. Lexacross is like a last resort name because I, I wanted, by the way, and I don't know why they didn't take this, I wanted Battle Phrase because I, oh, that'd be a good thing. The reason they didn't want Battle Phrase, which I to this day think in hindsight is kind of not a smart decision. They didn't want to confuse with their already existing battle chess, and I'm thinking, well, you know, why not? That's successful. Why not associate this with it? But they wanted a different name. We came up with Lexacross. The reason Lexacross isn't a good name is it ended up a lot on sports shelves because they thought it was lacrosse, especially since the X in the in their cover was sort of darkened out, and it looked like L E I C R O S S. So it got, in other words, it was marketed kind of wrong at the time and then it became too late they realized their mistake they actually created a new version with not with a regular person on the cover but people weren't the stores wouldn't buy it because they had already been burnt so it never made it out there i have tons of people today who still want me to do that game in fact uh, almost every year i have some company come to me and want me to do it but i've yet to find one that's willing to fund me doing it and that's what i'm looking for but even as we speak, I rejected two people last year, and I'm this year talking to some more. It's got to be the right thing because this is a game I've been waiting 20 years to do right, and it seems like a perfect game for, uh, especially cell phones and stuff. So yeah, it was uh, I'm not sure, you know, if this I'm, I'm trying to you know think about this in my head, you know, where, where it would be the most successful. I could see maybe like a Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook thing, or like you said, an iPad, iPhone. I actually came across a lot of uh, forums and posts and things where they people were you know, pretty much demanding that you uh, make a, a, a version of the game for one of these uh, platforms. It sounds like you've got some plans uh, in the works. Yes, yes. In fact, 
Another company a couple of years ago that's in Vegas what was interested in the idea and they had some suggestions and so I've actually incorporated that and I now have a new demo for Lexacross for this. But the reason, pardon me, that I'm not doing it with them is they have a strange thing. They said, well, we like this game, but we don't like the battleship aspect of it, so you could take it out. Now, if you remember how the history of this worked, I said, but then we end up just being a Wheel of Fortune. And I'm not interested in just doing Wheel of Fortune, even if today it could be done for money. So they took out, they wanted me to take out the one thing that makes it Lexacross and not Wheel of Fortune. So even though I did the demo while I was working with them, I and kept in some of their ideas, which I like, I never continued with them because you really, with works of art, have to go with people that have, they're not bad people, they're great people, they just have a different mindset of what makes this a good product. They said they uh, had a, a, one of their friends play it and she didn't like that aspect of it and my only feeling about that is okay that's one person you know what about what about the fact that this was already a game which I can show you if you go online and look up Lexacross you'll find there's a there's actually a fan base for it now if you go mm -hmm. to uh, what is it YouTube there's actually a nine minute video of it being played for nine minutes and the comments under that are just really ego boosting boosting for me it's like this was my favorite game why isn't this out right now and what you said is absolutely true I think the best platform for this right now would be uh, cell phones uh, things like that because we and Facebook would be a good platform for it as well because we're really reaching a new model for finance or how people pay for games nowadays it's no longer as much subscription based or you buy a standalone game nowadays we're getting into that phase which Hollywood has and TV has, which is advertisements and stuff like that and promotions. I really think, which I put up on another one of my Facebook pages, which I call the Game Design Club, a uh, picture which is out of City of Heroes, which is a band, which is a big billboard, and this is your ad here. And I can't help but think that that's where the game industry is going, where eventually people will not be paying for games; they will be playing games, and they'll be forced to watch advertisements while playing those games. I know. I see you scowl. I that. hate <laughs> advertising. <laughs> oh man, I, I don't. I don't. I haven't pay, ever paid a cable bill in my life, and that is exactly why I just do not want to pay. Uh, to watch ads. Oh, I know. I know. It's annoying as hell, and plus, it has a tendency of reduce, reversing the formula where a game now gets pulled because people won't support it, meaning there are great TV shows on that get pulled because there's no advertisers that will support it. This would then be the trend for games, meaning if you have a free game, you can't say, well, we'll pull the advertisers and we'll reverse to a model where everybody that's our subscription will now be paying for it. Nobody will buy that if they've been playing the game for free. So, And by the way, I mean, Facebook and Zenga is actually starting down that path because these games are played for free. And yes, you can purchase stuff, but they also rely, I'm pretty sure, on you know marketing advertisements, which you can find on the sides of their games. So. I think it's something like Lexicross, though. I mean, it's... Even I could see how the ads would work, you know, for the, you know, there's a good, like, the, even in Iquil of Fortune when they'd bring out the car, you know, or whatever, I mean, it'd be pretty easy uh, to toss That's, them in. Absolutely. In fact, some of the ideas that I've had recently for this is why can't the puzzles actually be based on commercials? Like, the answer could, you know, like Geico. Pepsi, Coke, <laughs> or like, there's various pe Coke products, and you're supposed to answer Coke. It can be used as a delivery system. Uh, by the way, the game could also be used as a delivery system for greeting cards. You could have a happy birthday where instead of actually, you know, having a thing, you actually play the game of Lexacross and it uncovers the board that says happy birthday, Tom, or something like that. I mean, there's many ways that can be done, uh, used that way. Plus, you could we could sell, uh, just, you know, just like, uh, what is that game, uh, Trivial Pursuit. You could sell different packages of um, of puzzles and different things like that so the game just lends itself entirely to a whole and like I said people just love playing it it's and the initial problem with the initial game was we had two boards and everybody had two boards and everyone even though the puzzles were the same in terms of they had the same words they could be oriented differently the game lasted about an hour and most uh, most game shows last about half an hour so why we didn't think of this before the new game everybody works on one board which shortens the game by half the time play and it's more of a, a game show type environment. In fact, I'd like to think about 
creating this as a real game show. I see no reason why it couldn't be that as well, though I have no idea how I would market that. So, I, Just hearing the description of the game, I just can't believe that you're having any problems funding this. I mean, anybody that could hear that description and not see dollar signs, you know, they, 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 they don't need to be in this industry. They see the dollar signs, but for some reason, it's. I think the problem is, is companies sort of, they form budgets and stuff like that, and I don't think companies really have it in their budgets nowadays to consider outside submissions. So even if some, let's put it this way, think of it this way. Let's say I have a great idea for a building a yacht, that I could build a yacht for half a million dollars that ordinarily would cost a million dollars. You take that to a, to a game company, they see that it's worth money, but they're not in the business of that, and in a very lesser sense, they're not in the business of, doing anything but games they're already being paid for. They don't want to pay out money themselves for somebody else's game. That's the only reason I can think because I have at least five companies. Okay, when I went to the Game Developers Conference a year and a half ago, everybody I saw that recognized say, hi, uh, do you still have Lexacross available? Would you be? Uh, and sure, I have all these people interested, but how come none of them are saying, okay, and we'll give you this money to be sure that we are locked in with you. Every single one of them wants me to finish the game on my own and submit it as a final product. And, you know, even the initial one cost 30000 to put together. I'm not willing to invest $30,000 of my own money in this if another company says they might publish it if it comes out, if they're not willing to at least put some money into it in order to guarantee that if I come up with something, they're motivated to sell it because it's too risky at that point. So, but like you said, why nobody has you actually looked into said, like uh, the Kickstart funding? Have you looked into that? I not yet. I should probably look. I've, I've decided my New Year's resolution was trying this year to finally get Lexacross published somehow, one way or another. And yeah, I'm going to look into that. Also, isn't there something like? I, uh, some people told me to look into Shark Tank, but I'm not really willing to go on. You know, that's a TV show where. You go on and you present your idea, and then they say, and some they have like a panel there, and one person says, "Well, you know, I'll give you twenty thousand dollars for that game if you'll give me fifty-one percent ownership of it." And it's like I'm not really as much interested in the ownership of it. I want to get some money from it, but I'd rather just see this out there because, to me, this is my legacy in a certain sense. So. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part three of my interview with Peter Oliphant. And in that uh, part, we will finally get to the Stone Keep stuff. So uh, my apologies to folks who've been really eager for me to get to that, but I think you'll agree it was well worth the wait. And uh, as always, I want to thank you if you have donated or supported this show. Really, really, really means a lot to me, guys. I can't thank you enough for doing that. If you haven't donated yet, please uh, consider doing so. Just a couple bucks. Uh, I'll post uh, the links on the show notes so you can find the uh, the PayPal page and, and do your part. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this is the a monster of an ale, quite literally. This is the barley wine style monster ale. Uh, it's the last uh, of the beers that I have from the Brooklyn Brewery in uh, New York. Uh, this one has a 10.1% alcohol. Uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty should be a pretty stout beer, uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. I seem to prefer the beers with a little kick to them these days. Um, let's see, born in 2011. I don't see a lot of information here about this, except of course that they recommend that you drink this in a drinking horn. So uh, let's get it open and uh, see what it tastes like. You know, some of you guys have been recommending that I drink some of these before, <laughs> before the episodes or uh, during the interviews. You know, that could be. Kind of interesting. Probably not so interesting as to you as it would be uh, for me. Okay, get that open. Let's see if I can uh, get this down without spinning it out. <laughs> I seriously don't think that's going to happen. All right, let's see. All right, so let's uh, give it a smell. Not a very uh, strong aroma here. A little bit of a floral scent, um, a little bit like wine, actually. You know, if I was, uh, you know, smelling a, a glass of wine, I guess that's probably why they call it a barley wine. You know, it's, it's got a very, uh, you can definitely taste the alcohol in this, even though it is very, very sweet, almost uh, too sweet for my tastes. Uh, 
a little bitter too. So I'd say this was a bitter sweet. You got that sort of syrupy uh, sweet flavor uh, with some real bitterness, maybe some uh, kind of cherry flavors uh, mixed in there. I can see why they call it the monster though. <laughs> I had to, uh, this is actually like my uh, second take of doing this and already I'm sort of feeling sort of uh, that sort of mental fuzziness. So <laughs> I better uh, put this away. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a good brew, uh, but I think I'd have to say out of the uh, Brooklyn Brews uh, from the uh, Brooklyn Brewery that I've tried, I really like that number one uh, the best and probably followed by just the regular uh, Brooklyn Brew beer, uh, which I got a, a six pack of and I really enjoyed that one too. But uh, the Monster, I think, is uh, worth a try anyway. Uh, I guess your mileage would vary by how much you like really bitter, sweet, and strong ales. Whew. Anyway, let's get to this quotation. Uh, this is a quotation from Pat Sajak, which I thought was appropriate for the context. And it goes something like this. If I were to try to pitch this show today, I would be laughed right out of the room. See you guys next week. Shit. Five hours on Blitzkrieg. This isn't how it was meant to be. Weeks holiday? I was going to get to grips with the Roman Republic. Get into the GI diet. Can't stop now. I've got to win the war for the Nazis. Yeah,